Thank, thank you, Anker, for the introduction. And it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, let's get started. Today, I will talk about some um, interesting phenomenon that we discovered when we, when we were studying uh, interpolation. Okay, so here's the outline. Uh, first, I will give you a motivation, a minimum numerical example to show you why uh, we care about this interpolate, uh, interpolation regime. And just to get started uh, on why we even study this mean norm interpolants. And then we'll uh, describe the main result. Um, the, the main phenomenon we find that kind of interesting and intriguing is uh, the shape of a risk curve, which we, uh, we call it multiple descent of the risk. Uh, I will get into uh, details about it, both theor theory and empirical results on that. And then I will get into the proof main idea, hopefully give you a, a sketch of the technical challenges and also a, a tool that we heavily rely on uh, so-called small bowel property to establish some version of restricted lower isometry. We find it useful. And uh, to make the talk a little bit more complex enough, we apply to neural networks. Okay, that's the, the part that suits the theme of the complex workshop. And if time permits, I can also talk about interpolation for classification. This is a more recent work. So uh, in recent years, uh, a significant significant amount of effort has been um, uh, put on to study the over-prime tra over tracer regime for uh, machine learning and statistical learning. So partially, of the, uh, partially one reason behind this is one uh, paper in 2016 by uh, Zhang et al. Um, about understanding, um, uh, understanding, uh, understanding uh, like deep learning need to rethink generalization. So here, I'm just going to show you a minimum example to show you why somehow interpolation regime is of importance, why interpolated solutions could be of interest statistically. Okay? So the over prime trace regime is, is the following. So the model class are complex enough to interpolate the training data, what, even when there is significant amount of conditional noise. So y could be very, very noisy, okay? even conditional on x. Okay. Even pure random y, somehow the model class is complex enough to interpolate such things. And it's, it's an intriguing question to ask why such interpolated solution could provide good statistical property. So here I do a very simple uh, simulation on MNIST. Yeah, MNIST uh, is the data that everyone knows, I don't need to uh, introduce. So here I take any two digit pair. Okay, I change it into a regression problem. So give the y label either positive one or negative one. I just run a regression. And I run a kernel ridge regression where lambda is the regularization parameter. Okay, so when lambda equals to zero, that interprets the training data. And here on the out of sample, I, I plotted on the y axis the, the out of sample error. Okay, and uh, so surprisingly, at least when we teach our students, lambda serves as a regularization parameter, so you should expect to see some like U-curve shape, right? As lambda increases, the bias variance, there is a trade-off, such that you expect to see some non-zero lambda that gives you the optimal tuning. But it turns out that for a lot of data that presents interesting structure, somehow interpolation doesn't perform too bad statistically. Just to show you, I'm now cherry picking, I plot almost all the pairs. Okay, interpolation performs best is not always true, right? It definitely depends on something, depends on the data. So you see, most of these pairs, interpolated solution actually performs quite well. There could be cases where a tiny bit of regularization could help. But at least it's intriguing and interesting to study why interpolated solution could provide you good statistical properties. And as I mentioned, that there are a long line of papers who study different models and investigate why these interpolated solutions are actually usually found in practice and performs well. Okay, so let me just uh, draw a very simple picture, right? So in this regime, everything is more like non identifiable. There are many models behave exactly the same on the data, so that's not hard. And also, interpolating on the data is not hard. So what is interpolation? Interpolation is more like, let's use the red dots to denote the data points. And interpolation is just connecting the data points. Right? There are many ways to connect the data points. Right? So 
if interpolation performs well, then just conceptually, you cannot just connect these dots in a crazy way. Somehow you are connecting the dots in a minimum way, right? So even without getting into math, you can sort of guess somehow the practical method of algorithms could favor certain functions, certain simple, certain minimum functions, such that could help explain why interpolation explains why. OK, now there are two questions of interest. First of all, what type of functions that interpolates the data will get good statistical property? That's a statistical question. Another question of interest is, what type of functions that the typical training algorithms or typical um, uh, models, typical algorithms, typical statistical models will give you in terms of like how they are interpolating these, these points. So both questions are interesting. So to summarize that intuition, there is a principle. So among the models that interpolate, that hopefully that the algorithm or the method favors certain form of minimalism. And that principle has been seen in many different situations, right? So a uh, minimum example is the overprime trisolinear regression, right? So if you start from zero and you've passed the, it runs the gradient descent, you pass the data one by one, you live in the data span, right? So you're finding the mean norm interpolated solution. Similar intuitions for matrix factorization, if you write, write out this over prime choice in, in this um, uh, product form and then you run gradient descent, then the mean L1, a mean nuclear norm is essentially like the Fermi's norm on the, on the, the uh, each uh, uh, matrix manifold. And Run stochastic gradient, there is both theory and uh, confirming the conjectures that this is doing some mean norm interpolation. <coughs> and kernel machines, uh, like the mean norm RKHN, uh, reproducing kernel Hilbert space norm interpolation, supporting vector machines. So, both supporting vector machines and logistic regression, uh, if you run perceptron algorithm, is finding some mean L2, uh, mean L2 norm, uh, uh, mean L2 norm. Uh, constant margin classifiers, right? And uh, when data are separable. And for two layer neural networks, there are a bunch of papers, both in simulation and uh, also the people are trying to propose some mathematical models, try to explain uh, what type of minimalism that the functions is trying to, to, to learn. Okay, so the, this minimalism typically measured in form of a certain norm that motivates the study of mean norm interpolates. So mathematically, you're trying to find the following thing. You're trying to search over the function of interest that minimize some sort of norm, substra subtract to that on the data, it gives you exactly the y output. OK, so another question of interest is to understand the shape of the risk curve as a function of a measure of complexity. So the classic uh, picture we show our students is this so-called U-shaped curve. Uh, as the regularization parameter changes, there's a bias variance trade-off, and there's an optimal model complexity that it shouldn't be too complex. Okay? And recently, there are a few papers uh, by Misha Belkin and Andrew Montanari's group. Uh, we're trying to understand this double descent phenomenon. And uh, I'm just listing two, but there are many more. Uh, the double descent phenomenon is this, there is this certain over prime size ratio. Uh, for example, the dimension over sample size is like one. There is actually a bad singularity behavior in terms of the uh, out of sample risk. And so the question is, is this the end of the story or actually the shape of the risk curve with respect to some form of over prime transition could be more complex. Is the question clear? Any questions? Set up clear? OK, so you have to impose some mathematical model. OK, so here, let's try to, there are two approach. Either you model the input dimension, and then you say there are some effective, low, uh, uh, effective intrinsic dimension that is much smaller than the, the true dimension. Here, we take a different, simple approach. We just directly model the intrinsic dimension. D as n to certain power alpha, where alpha is in between 0 and 1. Okay, so somehow the intrinsic dimension scales with n 
in a certain polynomial way. And as I mentioned, the intrinsic dimension is just an input dimension, so the feature covariance, let's consider simple case, is the identity. Okay, I'm not assuming Gaussian, but just think about uh, this. Uh, this intrinsic dimension is parameterized by some, some d as a function of n. Okay, and we want to consider a complex enough model that people still use in practice, uh, but not too complex that we can study, we can do some mathematics. So we consider the nonlinear kernel regression model and study the following uh, min norm in turbulence. So before I, I get into the specific uh, results, let me set up the, what, is the defini uh, what is the data generating process, what is the kernel we use, what is the assumption on the target function. So here the data xi, uh, um, we observe n data points. Each one is iid drawn from a d-dimensional distribution. And the, the, d, uh, the distribution actually is a product distribution. Uh, and each coordinate is independent. And the distribution of each coordinate satisfies some weak moment conditions. I will talk about how large, how many moments we need later when we are getting into the details. OK? And the target function is the conditional mean, which is the one that we are interested in. We're interested in the case, actually, uh, even conditional data, there's still a significant amount of noise. That's the statistical question we're interested in. But assume the conditional variance is bounded, OK? In second moment. Uh, the kernel we're interested in is take any infinitely smooth function. OK, this is a one-dimensional function. OK, let's write out a Tyler uh, series and assume, assume that this Tyler series converges for any t. OK, all these alpha i's are larger or equal than 0. We look at a specific kind of kernel, which is the inner product kernel, which the kernel takes in two data points. It outputs some, outputs some affinity or distance metric. It takes this specific form. You take the inner product between these two data points, you scale it by d, and then you apply the nonlinear kernel. Okay, so if you just naively use a lot of the machine learning packages, this is sort of the scaling they did when you actually input the data because they normalize x by and x and z by roughly the norm of it. So it's roughly each one of them by uh, one over square root d. Assumption. So assumption on the target function, we assume that this f star actually lies, is related to these kernels, right? It lies in the reproducing kernel Hilbert space. So we assume that there is a row star that is L2 integrable with respect to the distribution of the data that we need, such that the target function can be read out in this way. Any questions about the assumptions and clear? So the question is, given n iid data pairs, I want to study, we want to study the risk curve of the mean norm, mean reproducing kernel Hilbert space norm interpolator. Right? So we plug in a specific form of this norm. We can discuss uh, what type of norm should be an interesting uh, norm that, that people should care about in practice. But today, let's just assume that we choose a specific reproducing kernel Hilbert space norm that was defined by the previous kernel <coughs> and study the behavior of <coughs> such uh, min norm interpolators. Any questions? OK, so let me give you the main result first. So to parse the result, let's take any integer, iota, larger or equal than 1. OK, and suppose that the over parameterization ratio d equals n to the power alpha, alpha lies between these two boundaries defined by these integers, 1 over alpha plus 1 and 1 over alpha. This is roughly saying d raised to the power alpha plus 1 uh, and d raised to the power alpha sandwiches n, symbol size, right? With probability, high prob with high probability on the design matrix, if you look at the risk. Okay, here the expectation is taken over anything but the design. 
So x is a design matrix, x is n by d design matrix, the data matrix. <coughs> we showed that the, uh, the L2 norm between the mean norm interpolated solution and the truth condition on the data is upper bounded by this specific form. Okay, this is a little bit hard to parse. Okay, let me actually write it out. So let's call this n to the power negative beta. Okay, then their beta depends on some function of alpha, right? And note that this constant does not depend on d and n, it depends on all the others. And depending on the distribution of each coordinate, it depends on the delta, depends on alpha, depending on the type of kernel, but it doesn't depend on d and n. Okay, this is also a hard part. Let me actually draw a picture as I change different alpha and show how this beta scales. And then we'll get into the proof details. Uh, also, I want to mention that this is an alpha bound, right? So if I plot alpha on the x-axis, so alpha between 0 and 1, and beta on the y-axis, right? so somehow the larger the beta is, the better the rate is. As alpha changes, as alpha increases, what the bound there presents a following curve, a multiple descent curve. Okay? So we call this multiple descent behavior of the rates as the overparameterization ratio changes. Let me actually get into a few observations that motivated by this, by this uh, result, just to let you guys um, look and also think a little bit about this, this result. We find it kind of surprising. Let me actually mention a few things that why it is kind of surprising. First of all, between any two integer barriers, like let's call these integer barriers, there exists a valley on the risk curve. Like for certain good over parameterization ratio, there is possibly good rates. And this actually, there are many of the, those things in between all these integer barriers. And one more interesting thing is that if you look at, let's say, suppose you fix D, let N changes, then it's not always true that the more data, at least in terms of this upper bound, it's not always true that the more samples you have, the better rates you get. <coughs> they may this may sound a little bit Weird, but the reason is this, right? So the more samples you have, the design matrix, matrix at the kernel matrix could actually get worse. It's not always true that the more samples you have, the kernel will becoming better behaved, especially the imperial kernel. Okay. Wait, so the, the bound on the previous slide was an upper bound. So it's an upper bound. So okay. Very good question. Just wait for two slides. Maybe it will. Okay. Right. It's an upper bound. So are you saying that this upper bound we can now draw? Not yet. Right, uh, yes, yes, just one. Can I ask a question? Yes. Good question. Alpha equals one. And they're interested in, in by varying that constant. Right. Right. Here D is less than that. D is less than that. Uh, is this over parameterization? I mean, it's a certain form of over parameterization. So let me mention there the two things, right? Even for d equals to 1, if you are looking at infinite dimensional models like nonparametric regression, <coughs> nonparametric functions, here this function is a nonparametric function. So it's already infinite dimensions. In that sense, it's over parameterized. On top of that, the input dimension we also wanted to increase. This sounds like a really crazy class, but we are looking at a specific form of inner product kernel. So somehow dimension is a certain form of over parameterization, but uh, you don't need two dimensions to be larger than sample size to say it's an over parameterized re regime because even d equals one is an infinite dimensional regression problem. Right. This is a classic non-parametric class. Good. So Anker's question is, uh, is a very good question and actually that's what puzzles us quite a lot, little bit and then we want to see whether this mathematical, uh, we are finding some mathematical model try to describe some phenomenon, whether this model it's purely just an upper bound. It's not there, or there are something there. So in terms of over parameterization ratio, turns out that towards the over parameterized regime, right, the good rates, the, let, let's, we call it good rates, it just means that the value rates, 
are actually getting better and better. Right? This is saying if you are in the classic, like less over prime tracer regimes, even the best rate you have in terms of this upper bound is not as good as if you are sufficiently over prime tracer. Okay, somehow the bottom of the valley is better. And let's look at whether empirical, if we run an experiment to see if this upper bound is actually exhibiting similar beha behavior as the truth or is just purely some artifact of the analysis. Here is some preliminary analysis, right? So we run the exponential kernel and we vary. So forget about this scaling. This actually is the log d scaling, so roughly is alpha. Okay? Why is the out of sample prediction error? <coughs> sorry, out of sample risk. Uh, uh, sorry, the risk, the access oh, sorry, risk. So the x axis is alpha? Exactly. So in your theorem, though, wasn't alpha between 0 and 1? Forget about, yeah, forget about, about this uh, uh -huh. specific scaling. This is log d. It's not okay. log d over log n. Okay. Log d over log n is alpha. Mm -hmm. Yes, good. And what I plot here, are actually the boundaries. Turns out, actually, the boundaries that predicted by our theory. So we'll give you the formula in a bit second. Oh, even the these constants can be exactly characterized. Plot these boundaries predicted by the theory. Okay, so these boundaries are actually predicted by the theory that when there is a bad behavior. Okay, so this is what happens for the out of sample risk numerically. It's quite surprising to <coughs> us that right at, so this is roughly, uh, um, is, is, D, uh, is the constant order as n. This is like d squared roughly as n, but even the constant can be characterized. And this is like d cubed to the n, d fourth to the n. OK, so this is suggesting somehow there is somehow su such behavior that can be captured by the upper bound. It's not just an artifact of the proof. Let me actually put this side by side, right? So these are the, uh, the these integer bound, bound, boundaries that are predicted by the theory. And these, if we just use the theoretical guidance we put on the uh, numerical result, seems it predicts these bumps reasonably well. So if we actually have much, much more simulations here, we can discover more, but we didn't do that. OK, so just to give a little bit of context. So for the kernel regression uh, regime, when alpha equals 1, uh, Sasha and I had a paper describing why high dimensionality, nonlinearity, and some property of the kernel can give you good out of sample performance for this interpolation regime. And the alpha equals to 0, Sasha and Xu Jai uh, show that <laughs> like in the fixed dimension regime, with Laplace kernel, there's some negative result, OK? And for linear model, the alpha equals 1. So it's not nonlinear model, it's linear model. Uh, Misha Belkin, uh, Trevor Hasty, and Philippe, uh, oh, sorry, uh, Peter Bartlett, uh, they study uh, the, the so-called double descent phenomenon. As the d over n is so equals a constant, as the constant changes between 0 to infinity, there's actually a peak at, uh, to be more concrete, Precise. These two papers study the, 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 the double descent phenomenon, and this paper actually study what properties on the, on the spectrum of the design matrix such that you could have good generalization for the interpolated solution for linear regression. Okay, and for general alpha, where alpha is between, in between zero and one. Okay, for random Fourier feature models, <coughs> Andrea is an independent work. Andrea's group. Uh, studied that the so-called there is a staircase in terms of the eigenvalue. So they studied approximation error by the random Fourier feature, and they show some interesting similar effect. I think these are closely, so what our technical tool that shows is actually closely related to this, this, this sta staircase phenomenon that was studied by Andreas Group. And they study, actually, let me answer Anker's question. So in a simpler model, they study the Gaussian covariate, isotropic Gaussian covariate. They, they were able to put some lower bound, not on exactly this out of sample risk, 
But on the approximation error, there is some connection between these two objects, some lower bound for a simpler model. But the result is not in terms of multiple descent. It's, it can be translated to some scenario, but not with the case when y have additional conditional noise. OK. Any other question? Yes. Before you move on, can you give some intuition for why the integer power should be critical? It's closely on? related to the Tyler expansion. So, but I think a better intuition will come through after we, we show the derivation, show the proof intuition. Very good question. Any other question? OK, so just to see the theme of the talk, we can apply to uh, neural networks through the neural tangent kernel. So essentially, is, is, I mean, a considerate amount of effort I was trying to study this so-called lazy training re regime. Essentially, initialization is good enough. This is very closely saying that in certain regime, over prime tracer regime, the neural network model is very closely related to this random Fourier feature model, just with a different feature mapping. Okay? The neural tangent kernel is of, of a specific form. It's not exactly the inner product form, but it's quite close. The only difference is this a cosine, which is the product of x and x trans x tilde, normalized by the norm of each x. And you can sort of see that the norm of x is well concentrated. So it turns out that we can, we can also handle this type of kernel beyond the, the inner product of kernel. And the neural tangent kernel for two layer networks has the following analytic form you can check all the coefficients of the Tyler, uh, Tyler coefficients are positive. And turns out by paying a little, and there's slightly more stronger condition by paying a little bit log rhythmic factor, the result can be generalized. Okay, now let, let me go in, let me go to the details. So for some of those things, um, so the Taylor expansion, I mean, for the cosine, I mean, you only had even terms. In Very good question, yes. So you so need to- Some things should show up in the descent. Uh, in the multiple descent? Yes, so good question. Yes, so if the two, the two answers to that. One is if you stick with this even, even ordered uh, coefficients, I think it's a, it's a different co uh, descent phenomenon, just the bumps are <coughs> in different locations. Or if you really want to, I mean, if the Tyler coefficient only have alt coefficient non-zero is kind of not that powerful to, for for any function, you can add some constant with the right scaling to let the even terms, uh, old terms appear. Then the, these old transition boundaries will show up. Okay, so let me get into the proof ideas with the following. Uh, I have like 20 minutes left. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So the, one of the proof ideas is to establish some form of restricted lower isometry on these empirical kernels. Okay? This is a very vague statement. Let me refine it step by step to make it more concrete. The proof idea is on a filtration of spaces. So here, before getting into that, so this kernel is uh, like, there are two things, right? There's a kernel function, which is an infinite dimensional object, and empirical kernel, which is a finite dimensional. And the empirical kernel is trying to learn something about this infinite kernel operator. And the proof idea is on a filtration of the spaces, we want to establish some restricted lower isometry pro property of this nonlinear kernel, empirical kernel matrix. And this uses some nice idea that occurs in empirical process theory that Shahar Mendelssohn did in 2014, this learning without concentration paper. They were using some so-called small bar property to get into to substitute a lot of the classic concentration argument and get possibly stronger results. Okay? So let me actually set up the notation. What do I mean by filtration of spaces and restricted lower isometry? So it's on a filtration of spaces indexed by polynomial <coughs> basis as the polynomial degree increases. Okay? And you can sort of think about this as the uh, the eigenspaces of the infinite dimensional covariance operator that were due to this kernel, infinite dimensional kernel function. And uh, so let's define the empirical kernel to be nk. n is just some scaling. 
and essentially is just look at a kernel function projected to the data, it's n by n matrix. And you can quickly write out this n, this, this each entry of this k kernel matrix to be just applying this h on the inner product. Now I do Tyler expansion right, because of these integers. So this actually, because of the integer of the, uh, because when you run this Tyler expansion, uh, there are only integer degrees that is sort of intuitively related to Jonathan, uh, John's question, but the technical details lies in later. So now you can expand this inner product term, right? This is just basic calculations. <coughs> you can write the, the above line into the product which are actually indexed by monomials. There's nothing fancy, just do algebra here. Let me define a filtrated imperial kernel upper thresholded by the degree of the polynomial monomials that we look at. So for any multi-index R1 to Rd, let me just uh, sum up to this multi-index, sum up the terms such that the multi-index, the summation of the multi-index is at least alpha, up capped by alpha. So this is more like a filtered version of this empirical kernel, inducted by the feature mapping that has a certain upper degree constraints. Okay, so now you can define this polynomial feature mapping, right? So essentially it's for each data, it's so-called a certain coordinates that are indexed by the multi-index, right now the feature, each feature is associated with a multi-index instead of just one index. And you can write out this feature mapping. And now you can define some <coughs> version of covariance operator, right? That are due to this kernel operator. You can define this filtrated kernel operator or covariance operator that are of dimension alpha plus d choose alpha. So why is that? It's just a combinatorial factor, right? So if you have uh, D items, right? If you want to get a bag of items that is at most uh, alpha, there's all such terms. Essentially, it's the number of monomials that the sum up, the degree is at most alpha. So now this is the uh, covariance operator that are due to this uh, filtrated kernel. They share exactly the same non-zero eigenvalue. Clear? Good. So the restricted uh, lower isometry of the kernel essentially is the following thing. We want to show somehow O non-zero eigenvalue of K alpha is lower bounded by D to the power negative alpha. Okay, let's try to show that. Okay, here's the statement. So let's assume all the Tyler coefficients are inactive for any i. We want to show that with high probability, this is true. All the non-zero eigenvalue thresholded, uh, filtrated kernel has smallest eigenvalue larger or equal than d raised to the power negative alpha. Let me give you some wrong but useful intuition. We'll make each, we'll show like rough ideas and then refine it, show you the technical uh, <coughs> bit we did to overcome all these challenges. First of all, it's easy to see that eigenvalues of k corresponding to the eigenvalue of the thresh of the filtrated covariance operator. That's easy, what we showed is correct. Now suppose the monomials are orthogonal, meaning that let's say the second, uh, uh, they're uncorrelated. Let's suppose that's true. That's obviously wrong. Let's suppose that's true, to, just to get some intuition. Then the expected of this empirical covariance operator will be a diagonal form, right? And turns out that the diagonal form has very simple structure. Essentially, the uh, order one constant term and order d plus alpha minus one choose d minus one, order d to the power negative alpha term. Just this is just uh, some basic combinatorial counting. Okay, and now this is already sort of saying if, obviously this is wrong, but if that's true, we sort of get some intuition about how the expected uh, smallest eigenvalue behave. It should behave like this, right? It's the first thing that is wrong, but 
we're getting to detail how to deal with it. The second one is even so, even suppose this is correct. Now we need to move to a probabilistic argument to show, to show some <coughs> version of concentration, right? The empirical one is close to the population one. Turns out the standard concentration will fail. Let me show you why. Because now you need to, you need to take any unit vector lies in this large feature space such that the expected is close to the empirical. Empirical is close to the expected. But remember, this empirical, uh, the, is the population one, actually is very, very small. This is very close to 1 over n, not exactly. So any hope of using concentration, this 1 over square root n rate will dominate that. And <coughs> let alone, you want to use a uniform deviation argument, like a, a covering somehow over the sphere. right? So somehow standard concentration will fail. OK, so how to make it right are two ideas. Let me actually get uh, the first idea is to overcome the first uh, thing. The second idea is to overcome the second. But there are even more technical subtleties. But maybe I don't have time to get it. First, you do the gram schmidt process on the polynomials such that you want to make the monomials. After doing the gram schmidt process, you want to make the, the under the new uh, basis, the form of monomials orthogonal to each other. Okay, so for any this monomial in 1D, sorry, this is just, uh, just uh, polynomials, we can uh, use gram schmidt process 10 minutes. Okay, to orthonormalize it, that's easy, I'll escape it. Okay, then you can define a new feature that are actually defined based on the product indexed by the dimension of this orthonormal basis. Now you can show that there is an upper triangular matrix that's, that's easy, but actually there are much structure inside this upper triangular matrix, such that you can show somehow this transformation that maps these two feature <coughs> mapping are actually well behaved by some constant that only depends on alpha, but that doesn't depend on D. Okay, this weak dependent, we'll get into that later if I have time. Now, just basic simple algebra, you can show that somehow studying spectral property of this uh, s filtrated empirical coherence operator is very close to study this uh, new uh, uh, coherence operator that have uh, uncorrelated uh, features. OK, that's the first one. But a lot of technical subtlety lies in to show that this transformation are well behaved. OK. And the second idea is to use the so-called small ball approach rather than the standard concentration. And uh, it, it reads follow. I feel it's a nice tool to, to have. So we want to lower bound the smallest eigenvalue of that uh, covariance operator, right? And essentially, it's for any u, we want to lower bound this certain functional form, <coughs> plus u norm square. OK, so note that this is a quadratic form. So it's not always non-negative. So this is always lower bounded by the following thing, indexed by a certain indicator, just counting the number of data points such that it passes through that this certain energy level. OK? Now, because all these things are non-negative, if the following so-called small bound property is true, it exists constant C1 and C2, such that, that the probability of for any data point that pass through <coughs> this energy level is no matter what, and even any tiny bit of constant. The really strong concentration results here implies here on the on these uh, on these indicators, right? Because for any constant C two, this this sum of this indicator of super well concentrated with extremely high probability. That, that the number of data points that is larger than, let's say, C2 over 2 is extremely small, exponential small. Yeah. And this is crucial to the non-activity property of this specific form that we are looking at. Okay. Now, one technical subtlety is to establish <coughs> such behavior actually holds for this polynomial basis that we actually define. And actually, to verify this is also technical, very challenging. We use some Pali sigma, but this actually is one of the most challenging part in the proof. And uh, let me just describe why it's challenging and how, how that part works out. 
it uses some weak dependent structure of this polynomial basis indexed, uh, tensorized by this uh, dimension. And basic intuition is this following thing, right? We want to show weak dependency. Let's race to the third moment. For any three multi-index, you can actually show that the number of terms that the third moment is non-zero actually is only a tiny bit fraction. This is a basic combinatorial counting argument. I wouldn't get into detail, but you can show only a tiny bit fraction have non-zero third moment. But using a more complex form of this, you are able to overcome the, the technical issue and show the small ball property. Okay, so let me get into the sketch. It just turns out that both you decompose the risk into the bias and variance. Surprisingly, both terms can be upper bounded by a certain functional forms like this. Okay? Sur surprisingly, somehow both the bias and variance exhibits this multi descent behavior. Okay, then let's do a truncation according to the degree. For the second part, we use some simple bound. Okay? For the first part, let's actually layer it by this different eota. And for each eota, let's use the restrict lower <coughs> isometry property. And after some algebra, actually, you can show such a decomposition holds. OK, so let me actually sum, uh, sum it up. So this is also partially related to Anker's question. So uh, open question is, when su such uh, multiple descent phenomenon is actually inherent uh, there, right? So somehow to show a lower bound result showing that that this the, the race act at least should behave this way, okay? Actually, there are a lot of challenges to show that because somehow when there is additional noise condition on X in Y, to show such a behavior, you have to, I mean, it's, it's much harder to show uh, in this case. And uh, there are many interesting works recently to study the statistical generalization theory for the min-norm interpolants. And why it's interesting? Because the naive usage of rather marker complexity or risky dimension wouldn't work well. So once you do symmetrization or once you look at the dimension uh, distribution free type of theory, you wouldn't get good results. So somehow some structure on this data is giving you some good results, right? So somehow the distribution of this data really matters. And uh, Andrea uh, Montanari did a lot of interesting work. Misha Belkin did a lot of interesting work. Here, uh, Sasha and I also were interested in this uh, minimum interpolation for the past one year and a half or so. And uh, that's it. Maybe I don't have additional time for the others. Thank you very much.